What I'd like to do for the next few minutes is talk to you about glaciers and climate change and glacial lake outburst floods. And then we'll look at three lesser known glacier related flood mechanisms. So to begin, it is a changing mountain world. If we look at photographs taken of glaciers in the Mount Everest area in the 1950s and we go back and find the exact same photo point and take them again, we can see that what had been a debris covered glacier back in the 1950s is now a large and potentially dangerous glacial lake. Now, potentially dangerous in the event of a glacial lake outburst flood or GLOF. Now, how do these GLOFs uh, come about? They can hold, there's the glacial terminus. Okay, there's the lake. That, that particular lake holds about 90 million cubic meters of water and is held in by a fragile and unconsolidated terminal moraine. Okay, which really wasn't designed to hold in that much water or that much pressure. And all you need is a trigger to start a flood. And the trigger is most often a avalanche or an, um, an ice fall into the lake, which creates a surge wave that then breaches that fragile terminal moraine. Then you've unleashed millions of cubic meters of water. Here's one that happened a few years ago, photo A. Uh, not too far from the Everest area. It happened in 1998. You can see how much water was lost by the difference in the water lines, okay? B is a photograph of the flood as it happened, okay? It's one of the only photos I know of of a glacial lake outburst flood happening because no one, no one is there when they happen. They're in such remote areas. And C is the damage that was done uh, to this region uh, even 10 years later when I arrived there or 20 years later. You can imagine how much force is required to move that much material. That used to be a solid terminal moraine and now it's been moved in a couple of hours. Okay, but what about other forms of flood, uh, flood events, climate change related flood events that aren't so well studied? And one is what we call an end glacial conduit outburst flood. End glacial just means inside the glacier. Conduit means that there are caves that form inside a glacier and all you need is a trigger to set off a flood. So for example, if a glacier has a steep gradient, it's not gonna form a lake. Okay, it's the ones that have low gradients that form the lake. If it's steep, the water is going to run off. Uh, but in place of a lake, what we have are conduits or caves inside of the glacier. It's like a great big piece of Swiss cheese. And all of these conduits are filled, okay, with water during the summertime. Uh, they tend to be dry during the wintertime when Uliana was there. Um, but again, they're filled with water, they're all interconnected, they're connected to a surficial meltwater pond, and all it takes is a sudden release of water from one of those ponds to set off this chain reaction that result in a flood that comes from the glacier itself, okay? That's a place, you don't want to be there when that is, is happening. It's just bursting out. They seem to be increasing uh, uh, in frequency based on my very formal surveys, and we do have a really cool video of one of these floods happening. These, as I say, have been increasing in frequency and are having quite an uh, impact on the landscape. 
but people are already starting to uh, develop ways of coping with these sorts of floods. You don't hear about it, but they are doing things like building gabions along the side of river courses. They are rock-filled cages that divert the water, the flood water that comes. This is showing changes in this glacier over time. The first was in the 50s, that's in 2007, and that is just two years ago. Okay, number two, what about permafrost-related floods? Permafrost is thawing, okay? I call it the, the cryospheric glue that's been holding these high mountains together for millennia is now changing. And with the changes, they're not as strong or as, the, as they used to be. As a result, we're getting an increase in landslides, rockfall that we didn't used to have. Uh, here's an example. We were in the Mount Everest area in uh, 2017 when we heard there had been a flood in the next valley over. So we were able to get a helicopter um, and fly in and, and confirm that there was a flood. But what caused this flood? Now, here's a video, very remote, about 10 days walk from the nearest road, and trying to figure out what caused this, glacier, this flood. We didn't know. Was it heavy rain? Was it a glacial lake outburst flood? And, oh, you can hear how excited DJ is. This goes water and this burst out. And there it was. Can you see how that had been a glacial lake, and there's the brief terminal moraine. So it was definitely from a glacier lake, okay? What we couldn't figure out is why is that filled with sediment, or, or you know, up, up nearly to the rim, and why was dust and dirt and debris covering the glacier? If that was just a simple, simple avalanche into the lake, it would be clean and you'd have a flood. So I was able um, to get a helicopter a week later and go back and with two assistants spend the next three weeks trying to figure out what happened, okay? Um, and this is important because the typical study of a glacial lake outburst flood happens about 10 to 20 years after the event. So it's really important to get there as soon as you can. Um, so um, I got there, but I couldn't understand what was going on in, in photo B. Why were there house-size icebergs thrown for hundreds and hundreds of meters in photo C? Why was everything covered in this white dust for square kilometers all around me? Um, I wasn't sure until I asked a yak herder, and he told me, it's because the mountain broke, okay? Again, because of changes in permafrost, a massive section of that mountain in the top, Saldim Peak, broke off, plummeted down, hit the glacier. That was the explosion that pulverized the rock, that turned into the dust, that covered everything, that created hurricane force winds that blew down leveled forests for miles around, then cascaded into the lake and through a number of other cascading processes. That's what we call this, a cascading event uh, resulted in the flood, okay? Um, so here it is, another video. Let's see if you want to see what the flood lo looked like, and we can get this started. Ah! Ah! Guys, come on! In the river. Yeah. Oh, Shh. So it destroyed several of the uh, hotels in the area. Then we started realizing that this type of event has been occurring for some time now. In 2012, there was a flood event in Nepal uh, for the, the Kosi River. Very tragic. It killed 70 people downstream. And we think that the trigger actually was that, that red point, that, that solid rock that broke off and once again began this cascade of events that resulted in a flood downstream. Uh, likewise, just a year ago in Uttarakhand, in India, we had the Chamoli flood, uh, which 
killed 300 people and destroyed a major um, hydropower project under construction, uh, we think had the same trigger. Once again, uh, rockfall from solid mountains affected by changes in permafrost. Let's go to the third one. Okay, what are the impacts of earthquakes on glacial lakes? We did have a tragic earthquake in Nepal in 2015, so the U.S. Agency for International Development sent us over immediately to do a study, a survey, of three of Nepal's most dangerous glacial lakes to try and see what had been the impacts. So we went over, and I call it a rapid reconnaissance, uh, ground-based reconnaissance with local people. And what we found, there had been a glacial lake outburst flood, probably several of them, okay? We just didn't hear about them. But here was one that actually burst in um, 1985. It was the first glacial lake outburst flood to receive major academic interest. And here, that bridge and many others were taken out. But by this time, you can see people had rebuilt it, and they had rebuilt it so it's much, much higher over the river. Uh, again, they are adapting to the, all of these changes. Um, and again, we wouldn't have gotten a fraction of the information that we did unless it was for local people, interviewing local people like this yak herder. Uh, he spent decades up there, and he was able to show like major slumps or the loss of, of dozens and dozens of acres of grazing land by landslides that you maybe won't be aware of even if you're in a helicopter. So. These are the uh, three uh, lesser studied flood triggers that uh, I've covered today. And basically, in summary, what we have is the problem of high mountain regions have entered an era of accelerated glacier and high mountain hazards. And while our remote sensors are doing this wonderful work helping to explain why they're happening, the question still remains, how do you build community resilience. And today, I'd like to offer that it can be a combination of blending the best of the physical and the social sciences um, with participatory approaches involving local people, involve them in the research, and use of local knowledge. And if you combine all three, I think you probably have the best chance of arriving at the best risk reduction options, okay? And they include lake lowering. When do you lower a lake? It's really expensive, but sometimes you have to do it. Uh, when do you develop an early warning system instead? That's more cost effective, that's more appropriate. Um, when do you impose zoning? Okay, don't build here because your hotel is going to float away. So, what I'm saying is, in, in addition to the basic science that we glaciologists uh, do, is to also include local people. It can improve scientists to people. It can improve scientist to scientist communication. And that's still something we have to work on. We have to get our scientists, the, the social scientists, talking to the physical scientists and, and vice versa. Um, and number three, a really chronic problem is how do you make your information accessible to the decision maker, to governments, okay, who are the ones who can make decisions that can help mitigate the impacts of these catastrophic events. This is very important, especially in a time when these events are happening faster and faster, it's seemingly every day. Now, when you share information, share data with local people, not just the typical scenario of going and doing your glacier research and going home and never sharing anything, you put them in a position of making informed decisions uh, for their own uh, models as we've seen, adaptation technologies, they're already being developed by communities. They're not waiting for governments to tell them what to do, uh, or donors, or a consulting firm down in Washington, D.C. They're actually doing it. They're building higher bridges, they're building gabions, they're uh, relocating buildings out of floodplains to higher grounds. This is something that I think we need to recognize and also provide incentives for this sort of creative uh, thinking to continue. Um, promotion of international collaboration and exchange is always a winner. It's always fruitful. Um, I was delighted to bring in 2011 a group of Peruvian engineers over to Nepal, where there was less experience, to share their experiences with the Nepalese and the Bhutanese and the Chinese 
and then over to Peru to see firsthand how the Peruvians have dealt with this problem. They've lowered some 35 uh, glacial lakes. Incorporating hazards into large engineering projects needs to be addressed. Um, believe it or not, mo almost all of the major hydropower projects that are going on in the Himalayas, okay, the Himalayas have a lot of water, um, are being built without incorporating the fact that there are glacial lakes upstream, glacial lakes that could burst and destroy the entire plant, as we saw earlier that happened just a year ago in Chamoli. Um, so this also argues for perhaps the use of smaller, more localized hydropowers on local streams. I think we really need to give opportunities to our uh, undergraduates as well as graduate students because that'll put us in the best position to, to continue understanding what these changes are and also how do we deal with them. Now, to end, if you'd like to see any of my recommendations, okay, actually put into action, I'd be delighted to share with you some of our, our publications. And finally, as was, was mentioned, um, next month Elizabeth and I are uh, going, returning to Nepal and we'll be living there for six months, uh, continuing our study of glaciers and alpine ecosystems. The village we'll be living in is about five days walk from the nearest road and I just want to say, if anyone from Wesleyan is in the region, consider yourself to be a welcome guest. Thank you. Namaskar. Tukshe.